first recording. Okay, uh, welcome everybody to this uh, fourth session in the Seminar on Metaphysics of Science. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Vanessa Seinfeld as a teaching fellow at the University of Athens. Uh, she, she's gonna talk about uh, chemical bounds and patterns. So Vanessa, is you have roughly one hour for the talk and one hour for discussion, mm -hmm. but you can manage the time as you please. Mm -hmm. And okay, if you want to share the screen, I think that. Okay, let me. Can you? <coughs> can you see it? Can you see my slides? Yep, perfectly. Yeah, yeah? perfect. Okay. <laughs> I cannot see the. Um... Wait, let me just. Sorry, people at the University of Louvain can see the, the screen or? Well, <laughs> let's no. say it's complicated. Uh, I, I'm, 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 bit, uh, I'm not very efficient here. But to do, I mean, we see anyway a small screen, so it's okay. fine. Uh, I can start. There's really no reason to, to, to wait. Uh, I'll fix things here. Okay, okay, perfect. Okay, Vanessa. When okay. You Perfect. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me and especially Christian for this opportunity to um, give this talk. Um, this has been um, a project that I started after, after. finishing PhD. Um, can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yep. So um, let me give you a little bit of a of a context here. Um, so I did my PhD at the University of Bristol um, under the supervision of James Ladyman, uh, where I worked on the relation between chemistry and quantum mechanics. Uh, during the PhD, um, I was a bit resistant going into thinking about um, real patterns and structural realism, despite the fact that my supervisor has done uh, such an extensive work on this. So I started working on it after I got my um, degree. And um, um, I presented it quite a, a lot, this topic, but today, given the time that I have available, I will go into um, a, a lot of detail. And uh, the presentation is very much, well, it's completely based um, on the paper I've written, The Chemical Bond is a Real Pattern which hopefully I expect is going to come out soon. Uh, it's in its final reviewing stage. So hopefully now uh, I'll be able to upload it um, for everyone to read, I suppose. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of detail here. Um, let me start. So as you can see from the title itself, uh, the claim that I will uh, propose and support today is uh, very straightforward. I'm going to argue that the chemical bond is a real pattern. Now, this is a twofold claim. It is a claim about the nature of chemical bonds, so what chemical bonds are. Uh, chemical bonds are patterns, uh, but it's also a claim, a realist claim. Uh, it's a claim saying that uh, in virtue of being patterns, they are real, they exist, right? I'm going to discuss um, the claim in a lot more detail later on. But this is essentially what I'm going to try and argue today, that chemical bonds are real patterns. Now, why should we be interested in the chemical bond? Um, so the chemical bond is one of the most central concepts in chemistry. Uh, one of the most standard ways chemists use in order to identify the structure of molecules and the structure of molecules in turn uh, is also a very important concept in chemistry, but also in science more generally, uh, because it is used in order to explain uh, a variety of phenomena. Um, so not only chemical phenomena, for example, how a certain a molecule reacts with another, but also biological phenomena and physical phenomena. So for example, the boiling point of water is explained in terms of the bonds in the H2O molecule and between H2O molecules. Um, the DNA structure uh, is explained in terms of chemical bonds, even drug design, why certain drugs exhibit neuro uh, specific neurological properties, whereas others do not, is also explained in terms of the bonds that certain molecules have, right? So this is a very important concept in, in science, not only in chemistry. And 
this in its own right, this kind of gives enough uh, support of why we should be interested in what chemical bonds are. Now, you might think that uh, chemical bonds and chemistry being um, quite of an established science would have already have a uh, very concrete understanding of what chemical bonds are. But if you go into the literature, you will find that this is not the case, right? So what is a chemical bond? Uh, Mike Weisberg has famously said about this, that once one moves beyond introductory textbooks to more, oh, I cannot see the whole quote because it's the, the images of people on, on, the right, on the right, but you can read the quote. Uh, um, in full, I suppose. He says, one, once one moves beyond introductory textbooks to more advanced treatments, I suppose one finds many theoretical approaches, but few, if any, definitions or direct characterizations of the bond itself. While some might attribute this lack of definitional clarity to common background knowledge shared among chemists, I believe this reflects uncertainty or maybe even ambivalence about the status of the chemical bond. Now, this is something that it's not only philosophers who have picked up this ambiguity, you can also find it um, when reading, uh, you know, classic science uh, papers, even very recent papers uh, in chemistry journals, right? So, for example, Zhao and Al, who are chemists, have written in a paper where they study the chemical bond that later studies showed that the nature of chemical bond is far more complicated than initially thought and, the connection, and that the connection between the Lewis model and the physical nature of chemical bonding is quite in, what's the word there? I cannot see it in, I cannot remember what the word is. Intricate, what does it say there? Intricate. Yes, okay, intricate. intricate. I, I can only see the in, I couldn't see the rest of the word. Okay, good. So as you see, this is an actual problem. This is not a made up philosophical problem. It is a problem that chemists are also very much concerned with, what chemical bonds are. And it's not obvious what chemical bonds are for neither scientists nor philosophers, right? Now, let me a little bit specify a bit more how this ambiguity arises. Uh, so what one standardly does, what, what, what one standardly does, when they try to um, find out what a chemical concept means, uh, they go to UPAC, right? UPAC is the organization that sets kind of the standard uh, definitions that all that the entire chemical community accepts worldwide. So uh, UPAC has like um, a huge kind of um, repository of chemical concepts where they provide the definitions of different chemical concepts, including the chemical bond. And the definition of the chemical bond is quite interesting. It says that when forces acting between two atoms or group of atoms lead to the formation of a stable independent molecular entity, a chemical bond is considered to be formed, right? Now notice that this is not strictly speaking a definition. It states when we have a chemical bond, but it doesn't state what a chemical bond is, right? So even when we go um, to kind of a very standard and primary resources, we find that the uh, ambiguity is already revealed around the nature of chemical bonds. Um, and this becomes even more, um, what's the word? Uh, is even more revealed if we go into uh, the different types of chemical bonds. So in chemistry, chemists posit different types of bonds. We have covalent bonds, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, multicenter bonds, metallic bonds, and so forth. Now here we see that the definitions um, kind of don't help out in clarifying what chemical bonds are because they specify a different referent each time for the chemical bond. So, for example, the coval a covalent bond refers to a region of relatively high electron density. The ionic bond refers to an electrostatic attraction. The hydrogen bond refers to a form of association, whereas uh, the multicenter bond refers to electron pairs, right? So we see that, each, that the definition of each type of chemical bonds has a different referent here which is very strange because all of them seem to be referring to some type of chemical bond. So there should be some underlying definition of what chemical bonds are that encompasses all types of it, right? Now, 
one might think, well, yes, okay, we have this, but doesn't quantum chemistry and quantum mechanics, uh, haven't, haven't those sciences provided a way out of this? Haven't they given us a deeper understanding of the nature of chemical bonds? Well, unfortunately, well, to an extent, yes, but unfortunately, they haven't fully. Uh, and this is for one main reason that uh, Robin Hendry first kind of um, identified. Uh, the reason has to do with the solution of the Schrodinger equation. So what is usually done when we apply quantum mechanics to describe uh, molecular structure and the interactions that happen within a molecule is we solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So the Schrodinger equation provides the quantum mechanical description of molecules in terms of the interaction of its composing parts, in terms of the interactions between the nuclei and the electrons, right? However, uh, in practice, uh, there is no single way of solving the molecular Schrodinger equation. Uh, some argue that this is because it is in principle impossible to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, from first principles, and that is why we have to use approximations. This doesn't matter for the present debate. The fact is that um, there is no unique way of solving the Schrodinger equation. What, is, uh, in practice, what in practice happens instead is that scientists have developed different methods of solving the equation. Each method seems to accommodate um, specific kind of explanatory or predictive purposes or seem to fare better with respect to certain types of molecules, whereas other methods might be more um, accurate with respect to other types of molecules, right? Now, the problem with this is, uh, is that the different computational methods that have been developed uh, to solve the equation follow different mathematical structures and make different assumptions of the molecules that they describe. And this, in turn, has led to um, different methods kind of implying different understandings of what chemical bonds are. Now, um, in quantum chemistry, we can... Uh, distinguish between two main approaches of solving the Schrodinger equation. The one is the valence bond approach, and the other one is the molecular bond approach. Now, both approaches, these are kind of umbrella terms that refer to different kind of sub-methods that are subsumed in those two main approaches, right? But if we are going to look to the two main, to this, the, to the main distinction, we see that uh, the VB approach, the valence bond approach, uh, implies or rather takes that chemical bonds refer to the change in electron distribution and to the ener energetic stabil stabilization uh, that results from this change. Whereas the MO approach uh, kind of implies that chemical bonds refer to phenomena, which due to localization are neither directional nor subatomic. So here we have seemingly uh, contrasting understandings of the chemical bond. The VB approach kind of implies that chemical bonds are changes in electron distribution that are directional. They are identified with subatomic regions of high electron density. And there are um, uh, changes which imply, they kind of involve also the participation of electrons in a bond, right? Now, this is not uh, what this is not the kind of image that the MO approach produces regarding chemical bonds. In the MO approach, we have chemical bonds as a delocalized phenomenon that is not something that happens within a particular region of the molecule, but is rather a molecular wide, uh, a mole a molecular wide phenomenon, right? Something that happens to the entire molecule and explains its entire st energetic stabilization, right? So it's neither subatomic in that case, nor directional and it doesn't happen between two sets of atoms, um, as is often assumed uh, due to the VB approach. So here we see that we already have a problem. Quantum chemistry hasn't in fact clarified what chemical bonds are. It has enhanced the ambiguity that exists on the nature of the chemical bond. Now here, looking at the history of how these methods have developed is quite uh, interesting and illuminating in an understanding why we have this contrast. Uh, so very briefly, we see that initially, um, the method that was initially developed was a VB approach, right? And the VB approach was very um, attractive because, um, let me, yes, it was very attractive 
because there was, especially by Linus Pauling, who, who developed it in more detail, because it seemed to provide a bridge between uh, our standard chem understanding of chemical concepts and quantum mechanics, right? So the VB approach was taken up by Pauling, who then said explicitly to show how within, with, through this approach, quantum mechanics can become relevant to chemists. And this is why the VB was constructed in such a way so as to retain chemistry's image of the, at of, of the bonds, of the chemical bonds. Now, what do I mean by chemistry's image of the bonds? Uh, chemists were greatly influenced uh, by Lewis's work on covalent bonds. So the work of Lewis um, implied that chemical bonds, especially covalent bonds, refer to electron pairs that connect atoms. And this is considered to be kind of the basis of how chemists understand chemical bonds. And here, um, a quote by Lewis is very kind of uh, illuminating to understanding this image of the chemical bonds. He says, in the mind of the organic chemist, the chemical bond is no mere abstraction. It is a definite physical reality. Um, a sum, what does it say there? Something that binds, essentially, something that binds uh, atom to atom, right? So Lewis took that the chemical bond is a thing. It's an entity that exists within molecules. It is a connective that, that connects and relates uh, pairs of atoms within molecules, right? So it's, it's something that exists and it's there. It's part of uh, what composes a molecule. And this was very influential and kind of um, underwrites the standard of understanding of chemistry of the chemical bond. And this is also kind of the, uh, the spirit that the Vibri approach tried to also capture, right? However, then we had, um, Unfortunate, well, unfortunate. And then we saw, chemists saw that the VB approach uh, vo wasn't very good at doing predictions, accurate predictions, and that it failed to describe accurately certain types of molecules. So, we, so chem quantum chemists started to develop an alternative methods of solving the Schrodinger equation, which was the molecular orbital approach. And this kind of gave you a completely different understanding of bonds. It kind of dissipated its reality. It made it a more abstract concept that referred to a phenomenon of the whole molecule rather than of a material part that constitutes uh, a molecule, right? And here, Colson and Molliken, who were two of the main scientists who developed this approach, were very influ influential. And they actually explicitly challenged uh, the Louisian understanding of chemical bonds and its reality as well. So for example, Colson here said that the chemical bond is not a real thing. It does not exist. No one has ever seen it. No one ever can. It is a figment of our imagination, right? And this is based on his analysis of the MO approach, or rather of his development of the MO approach. So we see here uh, that quantum mechanics kind of gave us a good tool to describe molecules, but didn't help us out in understanding what chemical bonds are, or rather it produced different understandings of the chemical bond, which what is important here for philosophy uh, implied radically different metaphysical understandings, right? So we had a very anti-realist, eliminativist understanding of the chemical bond. And on the other hand, we had a very strong realist understanding of the chemical bond as a thing, as a material part uh, within molecules. And we had these contrasting ideas. Now, what has philosophy done about this problem so far? and philosophy of chemistry in particular. Um, there is one philosopher who kind of did extensive research on the nature of chemical bonds, namely Robin Hendry, who wrote this uh, paper called uh, The Structural and the Energetic Conceptions of the Chemical Bond. So what he did was essentially propose that there are two different understandings of the chemical bond if we look at the, uh, if we look at the scientific literature so far. The structural conception, which is in line with the VB approach and the standard chemical understanding of bonds, which states that bonds are material parts of the molecule that are responsible uh, for submolecular, for localized submolecular relationships between individual atomic centers. And then on the other hand, there's the energetic conception, which kind of corresponds to the work done within the MO approach, uh, where we take chemical bonding to signify facts about energy changes. Um, of molecular states. And here it's interesting, he, and, and I quote him, uh, he says that under the energetic conception, chemical bonding um, is a theory of bonding rather than an explanation of what bonds are, right? Um, 
So this is how essentially Robin Hendry tried to uh, recapitulate what is happening in science and how the chemical bond is understood in the entire literature. And indeed, based on this distinction, what has been done so far is um, debating which of the two conceptions is a correct one. So uh, Robin Henry distinguished between the two and then Michael Weisberg took this up and said, well, if we look at the structural conception, this doesn't seem to work out so much. So probably the chemical bond is something that looks like the, the energetic, what the energetic conception says it is, right? So, so far we have had a competition between the two conceptions and a discussion of which one more accurately captures uh, the nature of chemical bonds. However, um, what I argue in the paper is that neither uh, conceptions provide actually a way out of the ambiguity around chemical bonds. It's not that uh, they give us a solution, these two conceptions of what chemical bonds are, they, um, they explain the ambiguity that already exists around chemical bonds. And they, they summarize and highlight the main points of disagreements that exist in the scientific literature. And so that is why we have the structural conception, which kind of corresponds to the VB and the Louisian understanding of bonds. And then the energetic conception, which has been uh, developed based on, the, uh, on our understanding of bonds in terms of the MO approach. Now, the problem is that given this, um, neither, uh, neither of the two conceptions uh, do justice to all of the results we have from chemistry and quantum chemistry, right? Exactly because they capture one of the two debate, one of the two sides. Neither of uh, neither of the two manages to capture all the facts and all the kind of models and explanations we have around the chemical bond, right? So we have we are here a little bit in a standstill, and there are two strategies that one could follow uh, in understanding the chemical bond philosophically. We could retain the discussion and the debate uh, between the two conceptions and try to find evidence in support of either the one conception or the other, or as I wanna do today, ditch the two conceptions completely and think of the chemical bonds in terms of a completely different, um, in completely different terms. And this, as I will show, will also kind of help us understand um, the meaning of the two conceptions and their role in understanding the chemical bonds. Now, let me go to my proposal. My proposal is based on Dennett's classic paper, Real Patterns, right? Now, uh, as you might know, uh, Daniel Dennett wrote this paper about uh, what is a real pattern and what is the method of identifying something as a real pattern. So let me explain a little bit this and then I will go to how this applies to chemical bonds. Uh, there is a standard image in this paper of six frames um, in Dennett's paper, right? Now, let's focus on one frame here. Let's say frame E. So each frame uh, is, consists of black and white dots, right? Now, as you see, there are different ways that one can describe each frame. Let's say frame A. The one way is to identify the position of each and every black dot, right? Another way is to say that, well, this frame consists of six black boxes with say 5% noise in between those boxes, right? Now, what does Daniel Dennett say about this? He calls the first description, the bitmap description. So a description which specifies the position of each and every black and white dot that makes up a frame is a so-called bitmap, according to Dennett. And this, according to Dennett, is the least efficient description of the frame because what it does, it specifies the, the entities and properties of, a, of the properties of every single entity that comprises a frame, right? However, he says, there might be alternative ways of describing that frame that don't require identifying the position of each and every black dot, right? If such descriptions can be offered, according to Dennett, then this means that there is a pattern in how the black and white dots are positioned in the frame. So if I say, for example, the frame consists of six black boxes, this constitutes a more efficient description of the frame than providing the bitmap. And therefore, this is sufficient evidence that my description refers to some pattern within the frame, right? 
So this is what then it actually, this is what then it um, says in this paper. And this is the famous quote where he kind of comes up with, kind of encompasses his whole thesis. He says, a pattern exists and some data is real. There is a, is real? Yes. There is a description of the data more efficient than the bitmap, whether or not anyone can conco concoct it. Now here, there are two important elements for Daniel Dennett. Not only is this a method of identifying the existence of a bitmap, uh, of a pattern, sorry, but automatically if you find a pattern, that pattern is real. Now, of course, this has um, raised a lot of objections that I'm going to try and deal with some of them today, but this is essentially the account. If you have more efficient ways of describing a system uh, that are more efficient than the bitmap, then that's, that means that there is a pattern there and that pattern, in virtue of being a pattern, says Dennett, is automatically real, it exists, right? Now, let's see how all this can apply uh, to the case of chemical bonds. What I essentially try to do in the paper is apply um, Dennett's uh, argument to the case of chemical bonds. Um, and indeed, I think um, you can see that how, how this holds. So let me explain. Um, so Dennett's method of identifying real patterns applies to how subatomic interactions are described in terms of chemical bonds. First, we have a, a molecule and we describe it through the bitmap. So the bitmap is the bitmap here would correspond to the description of the quantum state, which is produced by the Schrodinger equation from first principles. So if I take the Schrodinger equations, make no idealization or approximation, the Schrodinger equation, well, what it would do, it would identify the properties and interactions of each and every entity that comprises the molecule, right? It would be a complete description in the sense that it wouldn't disregard any entity comprising the molecule and none of the interactions that happen with it, between those entities. So in that sense, you could say that the, solving the Schrodinger equation from first principles corresponds to the, so to the Dennettian bitmap. However, um, both chemistry and quantum chemistry um, have employed and developed alternative methods of, of describing a molecule. Uh, quantum chemical methods, whether that is through the MO approach or the VB approach, um, are more efficient methods of describing the state of a molecule. The chemical description in terms of the postulation of, 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 of types of bonds is also a more efficient um, way of describing the molecule. Therefore, this is sufficient to argue um, in virtue of the existence of more efficient descriptions that because such descriptions posit chemical bonds, chemical bonds are real patterns of subatomic interactions, right? So here essentially the argument is we take then its uh, framework, we apply it to chemical bonds, the, the framework works, and therefore we are um, we have sufficient evidence to conclude that uh, his argument applies here as well, right? And let me give you a more specific example. Consider, for example, methane. So methane consists of one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. So here, solving the Schrodinger equation from first principles would amount to identifying the interactions of each and every electron and nucleus that comprises uh, methane, right? All of the atoms, all their, their nuclei and their electrons, how they interact with each other. This would amount to producing the bitmap. However, uh, quantum chemists have developed different methods of identifying it in a, uh, alternatively. So for example, Mendoza and his partners have developed uh, a description of methane through uh, the density functional theory, which is kind of a sub-method within the MO approach, very crudely, I, I, I kind of describe it here. And this is a more efficient method than the bitmap, right? Also, I should note, though it's in the paper, it's not here, that other scientists have developed other methods apart from the DFT. So for example, quantum theory, they have applied the quantum theory of atoms and molecules in order to describe methane. This also um, represents a different, efficient, more efficient method than describing, than pro producing the bitmap. And then also, if we go to chemistry, kind of standard chemistry, um, chemistry describes this molecule by positing four covalent bonds, each bond um, kind of connects bonds, you know, the, 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 um, the carbon atom with each of the hydrogen atom. 
And chemists usually also, apart from positing for covalent bonds, also identify the length of those bonds, the angles that are formed between them and so forth. And this is also a more efficient description than the bitmap. And this, therefore, is sufficient to say that then its account is satisfied, chemical bonds are real patterns, therefore, right? Now, here though, we need to kind of fill a lot of gaps. The major gap here is what makes a description more efficient than another. And this has been a major kind of um, point of debate and criticism against it. Um, I'm not going to um, discuss in detail the entire um, debate, but I'm tr I'll try and kind of provide a definition of efficiency that seems to work well in the case of chemical bonds. Okay, so Dennett uh, first kind of specifies efficiency in terms of compressibility. He says that um, if the amount of bits that we use in one description are less than the amount of bits that we use in the bitmap, then this renders the, 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 the former more, a more efficient description, right? Now, this is a very computational understanding of efficiency. And I, I don't want to criticize against it or kind of um, discuss the problems that this might have. But in, in, in any case, it seems a little bit weird to talk in terms of compressibility when you have like non-mathematical chemical descriptions uh, of molecules. So whether or not this is correct, it doesn't seem to be very intuitive. So let's just see if we can, um, if we can uh, clarify efficiency in a different way, in different terms, right? Now, here there are two proposals. The first one is to just kind of remain naive about efficiency and say, well, efficient is a description that scientists regard as such, right? So scientists would take the MO approach as being more efficient than describing the Schrodinger, than solving the Schrodinger from first principles, or they would regard postulating four covalent bonds as being more efficient. What efficient means, we don't care, as long as scientists regard it as such, then that is enough for us, right? However, there are very, there, as you can already imagine, I suppose, there are some problems with this understanding of efficiency. Uh, one of them, I'll just mention one, is that this is a very anthropocentric understanding of, of efficiency, right? And then also kind of, it is a very dynamic understanding of efficiency as well. It is kind of subjective because different scientists might regard something as more efficient than something else based on the specific epistemic goals that they might have. Or also more than that, it might turn out that, you know, once we develop our computational means even further, one might argue that, you know, solving the Schrodinger equation from first principles is no longer regarded as less efficient. So this doesn't seem to work out very well as an understanding of efficiency. So what is the second proposal here? Um, the second proposal is to understand efficiency in terms of degrees of freedom, of minimizing degrees of freedom. And this idea is, uh, is based mostly on uh, Jessica Wilson's paper. Um, I don't remember the entire title now. It was in BJPS 2017 on degrees of freedom. But also uh, Lady Man and Ross has talk, have talked about um, an, a, a, an understanding of efficiency in terms of degrees of freedom. So let me explain a little bit what this means. Uh, so what Jessica Wilson has said is that uh, degree of freedom is an independent parameter needed to characterize, uh, oh, I cannot see this. Well, let me say it in my own words, a certain description has certain degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom correspond to the number of variables that we need to identify in order to kind of produce that description, right? Um, now, what Jessica Wilson says, or rather what we, the, the idea that kind of derives from this is that a uh, description is more efficient than another if it restricts, eliminates, or reduces the number of variables that are required to sufficiently describe a system. So for example, if one description requires has 10 degrees of freedom um, and another one has five degrees of freedom, the one that has five degrees of freedom is a more efficient de description, right? Uh, put in a different way, if a description can be formulated by specifying less variables than those required by the bitmap, then the former is more efficient than the latter, right? Now, I take that this is a good um, specification of efficiency for the present purposes, because it has two advantages. The first one is that this understanding of efficiency is no longer anthropocentric. It is a matter of fact of whether a certain description is going to have 
a specific uh, number of degrees of freedom or not, right? Based, of course, uh, on scientists' choices, but that those scientists' choices are restricted by empirical evidence and experimentation. And also, the second advantage is, is that it kind of uh, overrides um, standard criticisms against Dennett's understanding of efficiency. Uh, so the criticism was that Dennett's understanding of efficiency associated that term with simplicity. And simplicity, again, seems to be a very ambiguous philosophical term, um, an anthropocentric one as well, one that could be uh, you know, subje uh, subjectively kind of uh, spelled out. So here we kind of dissociate efficiency with simplicity. It has a more uh, robust and kind of um, matter of factly understanding, right? In terms of degrees of freedom. Now, what makes though the quantum chemical descriptions and the chemical description uh, more efficient than the bitmap here? So if we apply our understanding of efficiency in terms of degrees of freedom, we see that it applies perfectly here, right? And um, in the case of quantum chemistry, um, what we do essentially is apply idealizations and approximations and those by applying those approximations, what we do is disregard either certain entities within the molecule or certain interactions that occur within the molecule. And by doing so, we effectively reduce the degrees of freedom that are, that are required in order to produce, um, to produce kind of a quantum mechanical description of the molecule. And a standard example of this kind of reduction of degrees of freedom is, if, is the BO approximation. So almost all quantum mechanical, quantum chemical methods, what they do first uh, is make the BO approximation. And the BO, essentially what it does, it disregards interactions between the no nuclei in a molecule, right? And this is an example of minimizing the degrees of freedom here in, the Schrodinger, in solving the Schrodinger equation. Of course, each method employs other approximations as well, might disregard other additional things too, but we don't care about that here. As long as we can say, as long as we can provide an example of how quantum uh, chemical descriptions have less degrees of freedom, this is sufficient to claim that they are more efficient descriptions than the bitmap. Now in chemistry, uh, we can make a similar claim, though it's more, uh, qualitative than quantitative here. Um, again, chemists disregard certain interactions um, within a molecule when they produce their description of that molecule. Essentially, when they want to postulate the existence of a bond, what they do is they focus on the electrons that occupy the outer shell of the atoms. They don't have to identify the, the orbital, the, which orbitals are occupied by all the electrons that make up a certain atom, right? So here again, we see that there's, there's a certain disregard of certain interactions and entities, therefore uh, a minimization of the de degrees of freedom required. And this is enough to argue that the, in this sense, the chemical description is a more efficient one than the, um, than the bitmap description, than solving the Schrodinger equation from first principles, essentially, right? So this is a claim, and based on all this now, I think one could argue that uh, Dennett's account is successfully applied, and therefore we can argue that chemical bonds are real patterns. Now, we have one main problem here. Well, Dennett's account has many problems. I, I admit that you, one, one could discuss many different problems, but there is one that is the most central perhaps, and that is the challenge from pluralism and instrumentalism. Now, what is this challenge? It has been argued, so this debate started primarily from uh, Fodor, uh, that Dennett's account seems to allow that all efficient descriptions identify uh, patterns. And critics have taken this to imply either an instrumentalism about patterns or pluralism about them, right? So what does uh, Dennett say? Dennett say that, you know, as long as we have an a more efficient description than the bitmap, uh, then this means we have a real pattern, right? But he doesn't deny that we can have countless efficient descriptions that are more efficient than the bitmap. Because remember in the quote, he says whether or not one can concoct such efficient descriptions, 
So strictly speaking, he allows for the possibility of many different efficient descriptions. And why does he allow many efficient descriptions? Because he admits that each description uh, is allowed to make uh, different sort of assumptions, uh, approximations and idealizations. Uh, each description can choose to disregard different things within a system when they describe that system. So in principle, it po it's possible that we can make up many different ways uh, of describing the system, all of them being efficient and all of them identifying real patterns, right? But so which pattern is real? Which, which, uh, which efficient description should we take for um, as indicating the existence of a pattern, right? So then it doesn't really clarify that. And especially um, Don Ross has done extensive work in interpreting Dennett. He has pointed out that Dennett himself has been a little bit confused about that. In some writings, he seems to be more of an instrumentalist, admitting that, yes, okay, there is kind of a functional role in having these efficient descriptions. There aren't really real patterns, but then he wanted to retain the realism as well behind his account. So there seems to be a bit of confusion here. Now, why is this relevant? Because we see that the efficient descriptions, even in, in the case of molecules and chemical bonds, suffer from the same problem. So let me return again um, to methane. So for example, if we describe methane in terms of the DFT method uh, in quantum chemistry, the DFT would describe surfaces of electron charge distributions, not only between carbon and hydrogen atoms, but also between hydrogen atoms. And this would amount to saying that it kind of identifies or rather posits bonds uh, in places where chemistry wouldn't posit bonds, bonds between methane, right? On the other hand, chemistry only identifies bonds between and interactions rather, subatomic interactions between carbon and hydrogen. So given that both are efficient descriptions, then it would say we have to, we have to uh, admit both of them as identifying real patterns. But the image that they produce is a little bit different because one of them identifies only interactions between certain pairs of uh, atoms, whereas the other one identifies different ones. And the criticism goes like this. They say there are two options, therefore. Either we admit all of those interactions as being chemical bonds. So any subatomic interaction that is identified by more efficient descriptions qualifies as a chemical bond, or we are instrumentalists and we say, well, none of them exists. There are no chemical bonds, right? Everything has to do with the purposes we develop those methods. They have, there is no metaphysical weight behind those descriptions, right? Now, I don't, uh, I, I, this is a very difficult discussion that has taken um, up a lot of literature and I will not uh, pretend that I can provide an answer against any of those positions. But what I, uh, what I can say is that at least for a scientific realism, realist, none of these positions is appealing, right? Uh, because both interpretations, both the instrumentalist and the pluralist, dismiss in different ways the, spe the special status that chemical bonds have in scientific practice, right? So th there is, um, a as a matter of fact, in sci uh, scientists do distinguish certain interactions as being chemical bonds and others as not. And we should try and make our metaphysical account kind of um, consonant to that fact, right? Um, and in general, this uh, and here I'm appealing to a kind of standard um, uh, what intuition behind scientific realism that disregarding the success of science is not in line with the commitment um, of taking seriously the success of scientific concepts when evaluating the existence of the relevant entities, right? As a scientific uh, realist, you want to take seriously in, into account how science classifies and uses uh, scientific concepts in order to support the reality of the relevant entities. And this doesn't seem to uh, be in line with either instrumentalism or, or uh, pluralism. So what can we do? The point here is not to challenge any of these two views, but rather to find a way out of it. And how can we find a way out of it? Well, we can take up, what, what I argue here is that we can take up some ideas from structural realism. Now, um, structural realism is um, a very natural position to go to when you talk about real patterns, because it is a realist thesis, thesis uh, 
uh, that has been very explicitly and largely based on Dennett's account of real patterns. So the choice to go to structural realism isn't a random choice. It's based on the fact that structural realism have been, uh, realists have been heavily um, based on the evaluation and use of Dennett's real patterns. So this is what we're trying to, what I'm trying to do here uh, as well. Now, what's important here? Uh, the, the important thing is that structural realists, and especially Leitman and Ross, uh, have proposed an amendment to Dennett's understanding of real patterns. What they say is, is that real patterns are not only those things which we describe by more efficient descriptions, this is not sufficient, but they are those that indispensably figure in generalizations that allow us to predict and explain the behavior of the world, right? So special science descriptions, they claim, identify real patterns, not only because they are more efficient than the bitmap, but because they also make counterfactual and nomological generalizations that are very successful when we explain and predict uh, scientific phenomena. And this is what qualifies, and this is what we can use as a criterion to distinguish between actual real patterns and not real patterns. Because then it, this is what qualifies only some efficient descriptions as correctly identifying those patterns and stands as a criterion to discern those, right? Uh, so how can we kind of, um, how, how, can it, how can we rephrase this in terms of the chemical bond? Well, if we follow this amendment to uh, the account of real patterns, then we can say that it's only specific interactions, which in the scientific descriptions of bonds, of molecules rather, figure in the counterfactual nomological generalizations, because it is those that play the largest role in explaining a molecule's behavior. Of course, this doesn't mean that the other interactions do not occur, they do not exist within the molecule, uh, or that they don't have some effect uh, on the molecule's behavior, those other interactions that we might kind of dismiss with an efficient description. But we can take those as being negligible, um, nomologically and, and, and counterfactually right. And therefore, it is correct that, sci that scientists do not place them and they do not figure in the generalizations that they make when they describe a certain molecule. Now, applied to chemical bonds, this of course explains why only some patterns are identified as chemical bonds in science and why some are not. So um, that aromatic compounds, for example, are unusually stable is explained by the fact that bonds are formed between the carbon atoms, right? That water boils at a high, high temperature is explained by the hydrogen bonds that are formed between H2O molecules that metals conduct electricity explain, is explained by the ionic bonds. So here we see that postulating chemical bonds or postulating that certain interactions correspond to chemical bonds and labeling them as such has a very important uh, role in explanatory and predictive generalizations. And this is what explains why only those interactions are identified as bonds, whereas others are not, right? Now, uh, a criticism that can be raised against this is that the usefulness of a specific method of identifying certain interactions as bonds and others as not is not an objective thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's subjective whether a postulating a pattern is going to be useful or not, depending on the cognitive and practical uh, aims and goals and abilities of uh, the person who employs that, that method, right? And of course, in a sense, to a certain degree, this is correct. Uh, the usefulness of positing uh, chemical bonds and the choice of which subatomic interactions are going to be identified are, are, as such has a certain degree of, is, is to a certain degree goal oriented, but it is also very largely based on the explanatory and predictive success of the method that they use. And the explanatory and predictive success um, is evaluated in terms of the empirical evidence we have and we draw from the experimental manipulation and the measurement of the system. And it is this that kind of retains or rather minimizes the challenge from subjectivity. Because even, where, even if, we if we accept that there is subjectivity about which method we choose and what assumptions we make in that method, the usefulness of positing chemical bonds within that method that we have subjectively chosen is always evaluated on empirical evidence. And this is objective. 
right? The evaluation of it in terms of empirical evidence. You cannot make up uh, the experimental results you get. Um, so that concludes um, the presentation of the account. Let me go a little bit into the advantages of this proposal. Uh, I'm going to mention four advantages here. The first one, my favorite one, um, is that uh, this understanding of bonds kind of incorporates something that has been missed by previous um, understanding is and conceptual conceptions of the bond, namely that chemical bonds are dynamic things, right? They are interactions between moving electrons. There are things that are dynamic and time dependent, right? They are not a, a frozen uh, fixed thing in space. There is something that happens, a process that happens within a molecule. And this is very much this kind of uh, feature of chemical bonding is very nicely accommodated uh, by its understanding in terms of real patterns, because uh, philosophers who have talked about real patterns themselves have argued that real patterns are diachronic and dynamical things, right? Um, so um, this fits very well with this feature of chemical bonding because patterns allow for this uh, diachronicity and dynamicness, no, this sounds wrong, Anyway, this dynamic and diachronic feature of bonds to, to come up and emerge in the account of real patterns. So that's the first advantage of this proposal. The second one is that it resolves the ambiguity we had around chemical bonds without undermining or dismissing any of the classifications or methods of, that we have in science of describing those bonds. So all methods of solving the Schrodinger equation and positing chemical bonds all types of chemical bonds that are posited in chemistry, all of them are admissible in the sense that all of them identify patterns, right? And now, why do we have so many different methods, one might ask? Well, this is accommodated by the account because you can say that, you know, the proliferation of methods is partially due to the specific aims scientists have, like the predictive aims, the accuracy they want from their methods. Uh, but also by the specific characteristics of, of, of the molecules that they examine. So what becomes very, um, what is revealed, especially if you look closely at the different quantum methods, is that the main reason why we have so many different quantum methods of solving uh, the Schrodinger equation is because each type of molecule, the, rather, rather the inner workings of each molecule are substantially different or rather unique in a way. All of them come down to interactions due to Coulomb forces, but nevertheless, the final pattern, the final result of those interactions are very much um, influenced by the number of electrons and nuclei that we have in the molecule. And this changes the image a lot, right? And this is why we have different methods because some methods uh, manage to um, identify, for example, very, uh, accurately the interactions of very large molecules where we have many interactions between many subatomic entities. Others are more successful for smaller molecules, right? Now, what about the structure and ener energetic conception? What about them? Well, in one sense, those two conceptions now become obsolete. And in what sense do I mean that? In the sense of what they imply metaphysically. Uh, if you take the structural conception as requiring chemical bonds to be material parts of molecules, then this is wrong. And it has been already pointed out so by people such as Weisberg, for example, because then certain molecules are left out by this conception, right? Um, so you cannot say that the structural conception is correct in terms of implying the chemical bond as being a material thing. The energetic conception is also incomplete metaphysically speaking, if you take it to imply that uh, the chemical bond is a molecular wide phenomenon or property, because then you would disregard important features that chemists use uh, when identifying chemical bonds. So the fact that indeed in certain cases of molecules, it is a submolecular phenomenon. And this explains, for example, the reaction mechanisms that certain molecules undergo. This is kind of missed out by the energetic conception, right? So metaphysically, those two become obsolete. Nevertheless, um, they are so useful 
They might not be metaphysically accurate, but they do identify each one of them highlights uh, different important features of chemical bonds as patterns, right? So in certain cases, it is correct to say that the, those patterns have large energetic effects and like molecular wide effects for certain molecules as per the energetic conception. For other molecules, it is right to say that this pattern kind of is more enclosed in a more specific subatomic region uh, as per the structural conception. But in all cases, what underwrites both of them metaphysically at least, is that all, that all this refers to patterns of interactions within uh, the molecule. And those patterns are the result of uh, Coulomb forces, right? Um, and that's what the real pattern gives you here. It essentially specifies the nature of the chemical bond and also kind of supports its reality as a pattern um, without, sub without dismissing that the two conceptions are epistemically useful in identifying certain um, disti distinct features of chemical bondings under specific contexts, right? And now the other thing, the last thing that I want to mention is also suits very well our understanding of the use of approximations and idealizations in chemistry and quantum mechanics. So now under this understanding of chemical bonds, the use of idealizations and approximations is no longer a threat towards the reality of chemical bonds. It is can no longer, it, it doesn't need to imply some sort of instrumentalism of, uh, for our descriptions. Instead, the role of approximations and idealizations is kind of to, they, they correspond rather in Dennett's account to what he calls noise, right? So each efficient description has a certain amount of noise, namely things that it disregards, right? Um, each efficient description might have a higher or a lower level of noise. This corresponds to having more or less approximations, more or less idealizations in the descriptions. Nevertheless, they all identify, um, in virtue of having such descriptions, we can identify uh, patterns. Now, does that mean that every description with any amount of noise can be accepted as correctly identifying real patterns? For Dennett, yes. For a structural realist, no. This is why we needed the amendment uh, to his account of real patterns, because what, because what we say here is that science decides on empirical and theoretical grounds whether a specific approximation or idealization is acceptable, whether a specific amount of noise, let me put it in the Netian terms, is acceptable, and therefore whether the description adequately agrees with empirical evidence. So everything comes down to judging the description in terms of empirical evidence, and this is going to be the final stage, the, the deciding step into admitting that description as correctly identifying a real pattern or not, right? So that's the last one. Now, conclusion. I argued that chemical bonds are real patterns of subatomic interactions. Um, this, however, in order to circumvent pro the, the main challenge from instrumentalism and pluralism, I, um, also adopted an amendment to uh, Dennett's understanding of real patterns, one that includes ideas of patterns from structural realism. Essentially, we take here the fact that such generalizations, um, that, that these patterns have to figure in counterfactual and nomological generalizations, so we cannot admit all of them, right? Now, this proposal, I argue, is well supported by scientific evidence. It fits well with how we describe chemical bonds and how we use them. Uh, it does not undermine the special uh, status of chemical bonds in science, and, in and it captures very important features of bonds, namely the fact that they are dynamic and diachronic. And I take that the advantage here is that we essentially hit two birds with one stone. Uh, we correctly identify uh, the physical nature of chemical bonds, uh, while also proposing an understanding of uh, the chemical quantum chemical descriptions um, of those bonds, right? We don't dismiss any of the things that uh, scientists do with respect to chemical bonds. We incorporate them in a way that is consistent and also provides us a robust metaphysical understanding of what chemical bonds are. I think, yes, I've talked too much. Thank you very much. Um,
I'd like to thank, so I've written here all the people that have uh, supported me and helped me out uh, with this project. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm looking forward to your comments. Okay, thank you very much, Vanessa, for this great talk.